from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. This is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous vile and disturbing behaviors. This week's podcast will be on Dennis Rader. Dennis Rader was born on March 9, 1945, making him a Pisces in Pittsburgh, Kansas. So as we do, let's see what was going on in the world at that time. The late 1940s for the United States was a time of prosperity and high economic growth. The end of World War II was upon us. Franklin D. Roosevelt was the president for a few months at the beginning of 1945, but sadly he died on April 12th from the lingering effects of polio. The U.S. would deploy two atomic bombs on Japan for bombing Pearl Harbor, and Japan surrendered. Adolf Hitler moved into his underground bunker, which he called the Fuhrer Bunker. He and his wife of just one day would, air quotes, supposedly commit suicide. Joseph Goebbels and his wife also committed suicide after they murdered their six children. The concentration camps, though, were thankfully liberated. So how much did it cost to live back in those days? The average cost of a new house was about $4,600, of course, give or take, depending on what part of the country you lived in. But if you rented, then that average would be about $60 a month. A year's wages were around $2,400. A gallon of gas was just 15 cents. The average cost of the average new car was just over $1,000. Dennis's father was William Elvin Rader, born on November 21st, 1922, and his mother was Dorothea May Cook, born on September 17th, 1925. Dennis's older family history started out in Germany in the 1700s, though he also has Danish and Swiss ancestry. But sometime in the 1800s, they were living in Tennessee. Then they moved into Missouri before Dennis's more immediate, closer family members moved on into Kansas. William and Dorothea were married on April 7, 1943, when they were 21 and 18, respectfully. Dennis was born nearly two years later. Now, William was a member of the U.S. Marine Corps who, after exiting the military, began working for the local electric company KG&E in 1948, when Dennis was four years old. William made good money and the family would have been considered very average middle class. His parents were well respected within both their community and their church, and they were definitely church-going folk. They had their sons baptized at the Zion Lutheran Church in Pittsburgh, Kansas, which is very close to the Missouri border. Dennis was the oldest out of four sons. Then it was Paul in 1947, William in 1949, and then little Jeffrey in 1955. It was said that Dennis seemed like a completely normal young child. He displayed no outward troubling behaviors. Even his childhood friends said that, you know, on occasion they would do ornery things as most all kids do, but never Dennis. 
he would never get involved in that kind of behavior. He joined the Boy Scouts as a young boy, as well as participating in his church's youth group activities. He went to elementary school at Riverview Elementary School. He earned average grades and seemed shy or maybe somewhat withdrawn. A quiet kid, most would say. Now, William, his father, was described as, quote, strict but never cruel. In fact, Dennis said he got along very well with his father, but maybe not so much with his mother, though he loved her dearly. His father worked a lot and wasn't around all that much, and his mother spent most of her time reading or watching television, and she just really wasn't a hands-on parent. Dennis would say that she would let her or her husband's parents actually take over some of the parenting role. Suffice it to say, his early childhood was normal. He has never stated that he was mentally, physically, or sexually abused in any way. He went to church like a good little Christian boy, was in the Boy Scouts, which is quite common for the Midwest Bible Belt of the United States. But at some point in his childhood, the family moved from Pittsburgh over to Wichita, Kansas, which is just a bit southeast of the very middle of the state. The area is flat and there is farmland for as far as the eye can see, which is a considerable distance as this area is not terribly forested either. It's an important state for the U.S.'s agriculture it is also part of a very dangerous area of the country known as Tornado Alley. The people that live here are very, you know, salt of the earth kind of people. They work hard. They farm hard. They are God-fearing, but they are kind. This is an area that one would think would be a predictably safe and wholesome area to raise your children in. Dennis has said that his first memory of being sexually aroused was once when his mother was cleaning the house, you know, tidying up the couch, and a ring on her finger had become stuck on one of the springs inside the couch. She was literally unable to get her hand out and was temporarily scared and turned to tell Dennis to go get help. He said it was exciting for him to see a woman helpless that the look of concern and a bit of fear on his mother's face started the ideas of having women trapped and looking at him in terror. He also claimed that, as was most children of those days, he was spanked for bad behavior, only he found the discipline sexually arousing. Dennis also said that he felt like some of his teachers humiliated him in front of his peers, though that seems highly unlikely. If he was a withdrawn or shy child, he just probably didn't like any attention or being called on. Dennis said that he developed fantasies about bondage, having complete control, and torturing others while he was still young enough to be in grade school. Starting when he was 10 years old, his childhood celebrity crush was Annette Finicello, a beautiful young lady only two years his senior, who was one of the very first Disney Mouseketeers back in that day. She appeared in his dark fantasies as he got close to puberty and he would picture her bound and gagged. He also started cutting out pictures of women from magazines and he would draw gags or ropes on them. He would fantasize about how he would restrain and control them. He also developed a fetish for women's underwear and began stealing them whenever he could and wearing them when he knew he could get away with it. He later admitted to torturing and killing small animals, mostly dogs and cats, when he was young by hanging them. He also knew from the beginning that these fantasies and behaviors were not normal and therefore he could never discuss them with anyone. And evidently, he was good at keeping his secret because no one ever suspected young Dennis as anything but completely normal, well-mannered, a nice young boy. At 12 years old, Dennis had his confirmation at his Lutheran church. 
in 1960 at 15 years old there is a story that he and his boy scout group took a trip to arkansas where they went canoeing on a river but it had rained heavily as it does in that part of the country just before the trip and the group found that the river was above its banks but the adults must have deemed it safe enough to go ahead and they went on their canoeing trip a roaring sound led to where the river was above the dam they had to act quickly and the rest of the group were able to paddle to shore but dennis and his canoe partner nearly went over the other boys stated that dennis paddled as hard as he could and was deemed a hero for saving his and the other boy's life and dennis rather liked this attention Around this time, he began reading true detective style magazines. And just like Ted Bundy, he liked that they would graphically describe and depict lurid crimes against women. These magazines would depict women bound and gagged being attacked by strangers. He would derive great personal satisfaction and pleasure from these magazines. While in high school, Dennis worked part-time in a grocery store. While he kept his grades acceptable, he began caring less and less about school. His private but violent sexual fantasies became more and more intense to nearly an obsession. His peers recalled that he showed no interest in the exciting music that was being created in the 60s. His very small select few friends said he didn't seem to have any real sense of humor and he was a very focused young man he took his time to respond to people like he was choosing his words thoughtfully and carefully if you were chatting with him you knew you had his complete and full attention Dennis graduated from Wichita Heights High School in 1963 so this is the part where we analyze any potential childhood trauma or inherent issues that could have contributed to him turning into a serial killer but in dennis's case there simply was none i dug and dug searched high and low for even a hint of some experience he might have had that could have contributed to his future crimes but there was none to be found I found no abuse or neglect that would be enough to turn him into a monster. He mentioned once that he had been dropped on his head, but there is no mention of that anywhere in his history. If that had happened, I'm quite sure his parents would have taken him to the emergency room, and if he had suffered any real injury from it, it would be noted in various areas about his early life and no such information exists. He was spanked, as most kids were back in that day, but not to the point of abuse. He was the oldest child with three brothers behind him, and there were no stories of any of the brothers really fighting or not getting along, although I'm sure there was typical sibling rivalry. It is said that his mother paid more attention to the television or books than she did her own children, but none of the boys were neglected. But her attention being elsewhere must have been enough to set something off within Dennis for him to say that he didn't get along with his mother as well as he did his father. What we do see is a child having sexual thoughts and urges entirely too young to be having them at that kind of intense level. So let's look at that. First and foremost, it is normal for children to engage in sexual exploratory behaviors. Let's get that right on the table. But children with sexual behavioral problems are a different story. It becomes abnormal when the child reacts to victimization or trauma with compulsive, self-stimulating activity, such as Dennis's mother getting her hands stuck in the couch or he reading the graphic detective novels. Studies have been done and it is said that between 49 to 80% of children 
that have abnormal sexual thoughts or behaviors have been sexually victimized themselves. But again, there is no evidence that Dennis was ever a victim of inappropriate sexual activity as a child, and he certainly has never said that he was. So then it would be nearly automatic to slide him over into the category of antisocial personality disorder, right? And he does tick one or two of the boxes, but not enough, in my opinion, to really label him as such when he was a child. The symptoms of childhood antisocial personality disorder are abusive and harmful to animals and people. And yes, he was abusive to animals, but not to people. Lying and stealing. Now this doesn't fit Dennis as a child at all. While all children fib about this, that, or the other, he was not known to be a liar and he didn't steal. I mean, that's just something he didn't do. Rebellion and violating rules. Again, Dennis played by the rules. He did everything that anyone expected him to. Vandalism and property damage. Um, no, Dennis never did any of that either. Or chronic delinquency. And as a child, nope, that doesn't fit. But as he ages toward adulthood, we do begin to see some antisocial behaviors, but we'll get into that a bit later. So we know that there was no evidence of abuse. Dennis obviously met all of the typical milestones for cognitive, emotional, and physical development. He had no known learning disabilities, no emotional scars. He had no signs of ADHD, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, and wasn't on any autism spectrum. We can take all of that off the table. So really the only direction that we can seem to go is internally. Did Dennis Rader perhaps have childhood psychopathy? No outward signs point to that either. While he might have had a lack of empathy, guilt, and regret, he wasn't known to be a pathological liar whatsoever. He didn't seem to have an issue with accepting responsibility for his own actions either. So what was it then? Dr. Nicola Davies was interviewed and when asked why might a person like Dennis Rader be interested in bondage at such an early age, she responded with, quote, Dennis Rader admits that he became interested in bondage at a very young age. How such an interest can develop in childhood continues to baffle psychologists. However, links have been made between feelings of inferiority and bondage. A person such as Raider can become turned on by the sense of power and superiority that comes from bondage. There has also been links found between early childhood experiences of being physically beaten by an otherwise distant mother and quote, enjoying the attention, even if it is painful. Pain, torture, and positive feelings become entangled, resulting in a dangerous concoction that leave the person unable to gain physical pleasure without the associated factor of distress, either in themselves or, in the case of Raider, in his victims." Unquote. And again, I want to reiterate that most kids were spanked back in this day and they grew up to be perfectly normal, productive members of society. Dennis, however, does seem to be the one very rare case where it negatively affected him. So let's explore that. Children that are spanked can be at risk for negative behavioral, cognitive, psychosocial, and emotional issues. The outcomes can look like aggressiveness, elevated stress hormones, and changes in brain development. According to todaysparent.com, the more a parent hits their child, the more aggressive each hit becomes. This puts the child at a greater risk of bullying others and using aggression as a way to solve their own problems and conflicts. So if we dare to explore this theme to make some connection, we could lean toward this thought. Dennis himself said his father wasn't around too terribly much because he worked long hours. 
His mother was a housewife and was around the children nearly constantly. So it is reasonable to assume that his mother had control over the house and most of the discipline. She was likely the primary disciplinarian and her form of behavior correction was to spank the boys to correct that bad behavior. But again, this is just speculation. According to Dennis, and this is I'm sure an oversimplification, his mother on one hand either seemed too busy to interact with Dennis to at least the degree that he felt she should have had, or on the other hand, the one who doled out the physical discipline which unfortunately stirred sexual feelings within him. So it would also be reasonable to think that this could at least be a heavy contributing factor to his issues with needing to be aggressive and dominant over women and to have them bound and gagged, helpless and terrified of him who would have complete control. So after graduating from high school in 1963, Dennis continued working at the grocery store that he had been for a while. In 1965, he decided to enroll at Kansas Wesleyan College in Salina, Kansas, which was far enough away from home that he had to live on campus. His ever increasingly disturbed fantasies continued to spin around in his head. Dennis joined a fraternity and tried to make himself be more extroverted. He also began trying to keep a journal, though he wasn't very consistent in that task. But he did write about the beginning of trolling people as possible victims that he intended to harm. But he never mentioned anyone he actually did anything to. What he did note as having success in was breaking into people's houses or buildings and stealing small items that interested him. This act gave him a rush that he loved. Dennis also had to work while he was in college and his grades began to slip, so he dropped out after the first year. Not long after, at 21 years old, Dennis joined the Air Force, feeling that he'd most likely get drafted to go to Vietnam anyway. He was stationed all over, Texas for basic training, then on to Brooklyn Air Force Base in Alabama, then on to Okinawa, where he was for six months, then South Korea, Greece, and Turkey. He was an adequate soldier, and he was made a sergeant. Also during his time in the Air Force, he began having his first real sexual experiences with local prostitutes. He tried to get them to explore and to let him tie them up, but they would not allow it. And when the opportunity came, he continued to troll, but his journals again didn't state he actually hurt anyone. He did enjoy stalking women and watched them through their windows as they undressed. To his fellow soldiers, he blended in, just one of the guys. Dennis earned the Air Force Good Conduct Medal, he earned the Small Arms Expert Markmanship Ribbon, and the National Defense Service Medal. He was discharged in 1970 after serving four years and returned to his family in Wichita. He did, though, continue to be in the reserves for another two years. Once back home, he began working in the local grocery store called Leakers IGA in the meat department in Park City, Kansas, which is a northern suburb of Wichita. He also took a job in a Coleman factory on the assembly line. And Coleman makes camping gear and coolers and so on. So while being the best man at a school friend's wedding, he became reacquainted with a girl that he had gone to school with by the name of Paula Dietz. Like Dennis and his family, Paula was also Lutheran. The two hit it off and they were married a year after Dennis's return from the military. He was 26 and Paula was 23. Dennis continued working at the store and the factory and Paula was a bookkeeper. For two years, the couple settled into marriage and Dennis enrolled in night school at Butler County Community College in El Dorado, Kansas, 
earning an associate's degree in electronics in the spring of 1973. Driving back and forth to class and seeing other women on campus began to stir his deeply hidden and dark fantasies all over again. He quit his job at the Coleman factory and continued his college classes at Wichita State University in the fall of 1973. Dennis quit his other job working at the meat counter at the grocery store and began working for a small aircraft manufacturer, Cessna. Not long after he started his classes at Wichita State, the oil embargo crisis began. This was due to the organization of Arab petroleum exporting countries deciding that they would no longer export oil to countries that they felt were supportive of Israel. There were serious gas shortages and people would line up at gas stations and those lines were long and spilled into the roadways. If a filling station had gas, they would ration it out to say 10 gallons per customer. So due to this embargo, aircraft sales dropped dramatically and Dennis was let go. This affected him. It seemed like it threw him into a sort of depression. With no job to keep his mind occupied, the dark fantasies began to get worse. It was winter by now, and since Paula, his wife, didn't like driving on snow and ice, he offered to drive her to work at the VA hospital that she worked at. While driving back, he naturally fell right back into trolling the campus of the school he attended, or even as close as his own neighborhood, looking at women that he thought would be fun to tie up, torture, and kill. He would go home and fantasize about it for hours. Due to him driving his wife back and forth to work every day, as well as him going for walks around the neighborhood, he noticed a Hispanic family move into a house not far from his own. On one particular morning, he saw 34-year-old Julie Otero with her 11-year-old daughter Josephine outside their home. This stirred those fantasies in his mind that now he knew he had to act on. Each day, he watched the Otero home, and while he did this, he began to gather supplies for his hit kit, that's what he called it, or his kill kit. A gun, cords, tools to be able to break into the home, knives, and so on. Once he felt he knew the schedule and routine of the Otero house, he decided to act. On the morning of January 15, 1974, he walked to the house, quietly through the yard, and cut their phone line. He then stood at the back door. He actually had a moment where he nearly talked himself out of it, but instead he walked right through the door. He had not been prepared for what he found inside. 38-year-old Joe Otero was still at home, along with his wife, Julie, their daughter, Josephine, and their nine-year-old son, Joey. They also had a dog that was none too pleased to see a stranger in the house. He knew he had to act fast, so he pulled out his gun He pointed it at the family and demanded they put their dog outside, and they obviously complied. Dennis explained to the family that he was a criminal and only needed money, food, and a car to get away. Joe asked if this was a joke, but when Dennis ordered everyone on the ground, he knew otherwise. Dennis then told the family to go into one of the bedrooms where he was able to tie them all up. I mean, for the most part, the family was in shock enough at seeing a gun, at least, that they complied with his demands. But once Dennis put a bag over Joe's head, it turned into chaos. Joe fought hard for his life and was somehow able to rip holes in the bag over his face. So Dennis strangled him with a ligature and killed him. He then grabbed Julie and attempted to strangle her, but it dawned on him that it took so much longer to kill someone this way than it did in the movies. He thought he had killed her and she was out for a bit, but she began breathing again. She begged for the life of her children and Dennis was forced to strangle her a second time and he killed her. 
Dennis then took young Joey into his bedroom where he suffocated and strangled him. And guys, disclaimer, this is going to be rough, okay? He had tied that ligature around the boy's neck so that he could then go just passively grab a chair, bring it into the room, and sit and watch this helpless little boy roll off of his bed and slowly die face down on the floor. He then went to Josephine and tried to strangle her, but she revived, so he escorted her down into the basement. He tied a noose and put it around her little neck, telling her she was on her way to heaven to join her family. He asked where a camera might be, and she told him that they didn't have one, so he hung her from a sewer pipe. He had also partially undressed her. Dennis then stood there and... Let's say he left DNA evidence behind her legs on the pipe. Once he was satiated, he picked up around the areas of the bodies, he made sure to collect all of his own items, and he left, but not necessarily in a hurry. After meandering around the house, he stole Joe's watch, then entered the family's car and drove it to a nearby grocery store's parking lot. He then threw the keys to the car onto the roof of the store and he walked away. When he got home, he realized he had actually left his knife at the scene, so he drove his own car back to the Otero residence and retrieved it. Sadly, later that afternoon, the three surviving Otero children arrived home from school and they're the ones that discovered their family's murdered bodies in their house. Three months later, in April, Raider was already stalking another victim, 21-year-old Catherine Bright. On April 4th, he let himself into her home and hid in her bedroom for hours. At 2 p.m., Catherine came back home and had brought with her her younger brother, Kevin. Dennis hadn't accounted for another person being in the home, but he made do. He walked out of the bedroom pointing a gun at the pair who were completely caught off guard. He told them he was a wanted criminal from California trying to get to New York and that all he needed from them was money and her car. He then made them walk into the bedroom and he forced Kevin to tie up his own sister. He then took Kevin into another room and tied him up but Kevin was able to get loose of his bindings and he proceeded to jump Dennis and they fought viciously. Kevin nearly got Dennis's gun away from him, but Dennis gained enough control to shoot Kevin in the face. Kevin remained conscious and continued to fight for his life and Dennis shot him a second time in the head. Thinking Kevin was dead, he returned to Catherine, who also put up such a struggle that Dennis decided to use his knife. He stabbed her repeatedly. He then heard Kevin running out of the front door, screaming for help, and knew he needed to leave immediately and actually escaped on foot. After a few blocks, he made it to his parked car, got in, and simply drove home. However, he had left his kill kit at the scene. When he got home, he cleaned up, he calmed his nerves, and by the time he needed to go pick up Paula from work, he was completely settled back into the mask of normality. Catherine died a few hours later in the hospital, but miraculously, somehow, Kevin survived. The attacks were big news in such a nondescript, wholesome, and presumably safe part of the Midwest, and Dennis got off on it. But eventually, it got moved from the front page to somewhere else in the newspaper, just any old updates, and Dennis decided to act. In October 1974, the Wichita Eagle newspaper editor got a call telling him that there was a letter hidden in a book about engineering at the Wichita Public Library. The editor called the police and they found the letter. I found that letter and I'll read it verbatim, grammatical errors and all. So the letter said, and disclaimer, this is not nice, quote, 
I write this letter to you for the sake of the taxpayer as well as your time. Those three dude you have in custody are just talking to get publicity for the Otero murders. They know nothing at all. I did it by myself and no one's help. There has been no talk either. Let's put it straight. Joe, position, southwest bedroom, feet tied to the bed, head pointed in a southerly direction. Bondage, window blind cord. Garrett, blind cord, brown belt. Death, the old bag trick and strangulation with clothesline rope. Clothed, white sweatshirt, green pants. Comments, he threw up at one time. Had rib injury from Rick few week before, laying on coat. Julie, position, laying on her back, crosswise on the bed, pointed in southwestern direction, face cover with a pillow. Bondage, blind cord. Garrett, clothesline cord, tie in a clove hitch. Death, strangulation twice. Clothes, blue house coat, black slack, white sock comments blood on face from too much pressure on the neck bed unmade josephine position hanging by the neck in the northwest part of the basement dryer or freezer north of her body bondage hand tie with blind cord feet and lower knees upper knees and waist with clothesline cord all one length garrett Rough hemp rope, one quarter inch diameter, noose with four or five turns. Clothes, dark bra cut in the middle, sock. Death, strangulation once, hung. Comments, most of her clothes at the bottom of the stairs, green pants and panties. Her glasses in the southwest bedroom. Joseph, position, in the east bedroom, laying on his back, pointed in eastern direction. Bondage, blind cord, Garrett, three hoods, white t-shirt, white plastic bag, another t-shirt, clothesline cord with clove hitch. Death, suffocation once, strangulation suffocation with the old bag trick. Clothes, brown pants, yellow brown striped t-shirt. Comments, his radio is blaring. All victims had their hands tied behind their backs. Gags of pillowcase material. Slip knots on Joe and Joseph neck to hold leg down or was at one time. Purse contents south of the table. Spilled drink in that area also, kids making lunches. Door shade in red chair in living room. Otero's watch missing. I needed one so I took it. Runs good. Thermostat turned down. Car was dirty inside, out of gas. I'm sorry this happened to society. Good luck with your hunting. Yours, truly, guiltily, P.S. Since sex criminals do not change their M.O. or by nature cannot do so, I will not change mine. The code words for me will be, bind them, torture them, kill them, B.T.K. You see, be at it again. They will be on the next victim. Unquote. Now, I don't know why he said that Joseph was laying on his back in his letter because he wasn't. He was found face down. So the next month, November of 1974, Dennis Rader got a job with ADT Security, which is a company that does home security systems. Dennis's job would be to go to customers' homes and install the units. A perfect job for someone who liked to stalk people and break into their homes. More often than not, he would be installing a homeowner's system while the homeowner stood there and would chit chat with him about the BTK killer. By this time, his wife Paula was pregnant with their first child. Between training and working for ADT, installing security systems, night classes, and taking care of his pregnant wife, he became too busy to have a lot of time to troll for other victims, though he did admit that he never fully stopped. Then his first child, Brian, was born on July 27, 1975. He, his wife Paula, and the baby were loyal members of the Christ Lutheran Church. But not being able to control his urges any longer, Rader decided he needed to act. 
On March 17, 1977, 32-year-old Dennis, who had been watching a specific neighborhood for quite some time, decided on a woman whom he had met at a bar and took a liking to. Cheryl and her roommate rented a house together and they threw parties together at their place. He decided that he would act. He broke into the home. He waited, but neither of the girls ever came home, so he left. Lucky for them, he decided on another house that he had been watching, but again, no one came home. He was frustrated. Raider was walking down the street and he saw five-year-old Steve Relford. He showed young Steve a picture of his wife and his infant son and asked if he recognized them. The boy shook his head no and finished walking home. Not long after, Steve heard a knock on the door and when he answered, he saw that same man standing there. Dennis pretended to be an official that needed to speak with his mother. So naturally, Steve let him in. His eight-year-old brother and four-year-old sister were also home. Dennis turned off the television and he closed the blinds. Steve's mother walked into the living room, surprised that a man was in the house and asked what was going on. Dennis pulled out his gun and told the children to go into the bathroom. He then fixed the bathroom door in some way where they couldn't get out. He then turned to the mother, 24-year-old Shirley Vian, and bound her. She assumed she was about to be raped and she became physically sick. So get this, Dennis brought her a glass of water and allowed her to have a cigarette to help calm her down. He then strangled her with a cord until she died and then he left his DNA evidence on her underwear next to her body. The house phone rang, which actually rattled Dennis enough that he left the house before he could kill the children. The children eventually were able to get out of the bathroom and they called for help. In December of 1977, Dennis saw and became focused on 25-year-old Nancy Fox. He stalked her for some time before he decided to act. On December 8th, he cut her phone line and then gained entry into her duplex through a window. He then patiently waited for her to get home from work. Once she got home, he confronted her in the kitchen, telling her that he was BTK, then made her get partially undressed and tied her to her bed. He then undressed himself and strangled her with a ligature until she died. He then pleasured himself over a nightgown that was near her body and then he left. The next day, as he was driving around for work, he went to a phone booth and he called the police. He said, quote, yes, you will find a homicide at 843 South Pershing, Nancy Fox. That is correct, unquote. Then he just let go of the receiver like a mic drop, letting it hang, and he walked away. Not long after, Nancy's body was discovered. Now, as is customary when phone calls are received at a police station, this phone conversation was recorded. It was played repeatedly in all forms of media in the Wichita area. But no one, not his co-workers, not his family, not even his wife recognized his voice. And at this point, Paula was pregnant with their second child. A couple of months later, the Wichita Eagle received a postcard with a poem titled Shirley Locks. The poem starts with, quote, Shirley Locks, Shirley Locks, wilt thou be mine, unquote. And though it is described as sarcastic, I could not find the entire poem other than one image that I had to blow up and it was just too blurry to make out the rest of the words. So I do apologize for that, by the way. But the postcard didn't get the immediate and loud attention that he had intended it to. So he wrote a letter claiming he was the killer and took full responsibility for murdering the Otero family, Shirley Vian and Nancy Fox, and another victim that he didn't name, who is assumed to be Catherine Bright. It started with a poem about his victim, Nancy, that read, quote, Oh, death to Nancy. What is this that I can see? 
Cold icy hands taking hold of me, for death has come, you all can see. Hell has opened it gates to trick me. Oh death, oh death, can't you spare me over for another year? I'll stuff your jaws till you can't talk. I'll blind your legs till you can't walk. I'll tie your hands till you can't make a stand. And finally, I'll close your eyes so you can't see. I'll bring sexual death unto you for me. BTK. Unquote. Then the letter stated in all of its horrid grammatical glory, quote, I find the newspaper not writing about the poem on Vianne unamusing. A little paragraph would have been enough. I know it not the media fault. The police chief, he keep things quiet and doesn't let the public know they're a psycho running around loose, strangling mostly women. There's seven in the ground. Who will be next? How many do I have to kill before I get a name in the paper or some national attention? Do the cop think that all these deaths are not related? Golly gee, yes, the MO is different in each, but look, a pattern is developing. The victims are tie up, most have been women, phone cut, bring some bondage matter, sadist tendencies, no struggle outside the death spot, no witness except the Vane's kids. They were very lucky, a phone call saved them. I was going to tape the boys and put plastics bag over their head like I did Joseph and Shirley, and then hang the girl. Gog oh gog, what a beautiful sexual relief that would been. Josephine, when I hung her, really turned me on. Her pleading for mercy, then the rope took hold. She helpless, staring at me with wide terror. Phil eyes the rope getting tighter and tighter. You don't understand these things because you're not under the influence of Factor X. The same thing that made Son of Sam, Jack the Ripper, Havery Glatman, Boston Strandler, Dr. H.H. H. Holes, Pantyhose Strangler of Florida, Hillside Strangler, Ted of the West Coast, and many more infamous character kill, which seems senseless, but we cannot help it. There is no help, no cure, except death or being caught and put away. It is a terrible nightmare, but you see, I don't lose any sleep over it. After a think like Fox, I come home and go about life like anyone else, and I will be like that until the urge hit me again. It not continuous, and I don't have a lot of time. It take time to set a kill. One mistake and it all over. Since I about blew it on the phone, handwriting is out, letter guide is too long, and typewriter can be traced too. My short poem of death, and maybe a drawing, later on real picture, and maybe a tape of the sound will come your way. How ill you know me. Before a murder or murders, you will receive a copy of the initials BTK. You keep that copy, the original will show up someday on Guess Who? May you not be the unluck one. PS2. How about some name for me? It's time. Seven down and many more to go. I like the following. How about you? The BTK Strangler. Wichita Strangler. Poetic Strangler. The Bondage Strangler. Or Psycho. The Wichita Hangman. The Wichita Executioner, the Garrett Phantom, the Asphyxiator, BTK, unquote. So there were several other pages, but they just described the murder scenes. So at this point, the authorities felt that they needed to make a public statement to warn the public that Wichita had a verified serial killer on the loose. They warned citizens to ensure that their doors and locks were secure and to keep an eye on each other. Women became so frightened that they would immediately check their phone for a dial tone when returning from leaving their house. But Dennis and Paula became new parents again as their daughter, Carrie, was born on June 13, 1978. Now that he was a father to two small children and trying to continue his studies at Wichita State, along with working for ADT, he was just too busy to act on his impulses for a while and things quieted down. However, in April of the next year, Dennis couldn't control his urge anymore and he broke into the home of newly widowed 63-year-old Anna Williams. He waited for quite a long time before giving up, stealing 
you know, a few small items and leaving her house. Anna arrived back home later that same evening. Then, in early June, Anna got a package in the mail. She opened it, found the items that he had taken from her house, a drawing of what Dennis had intended to do to her, and a poem called, quote, Oh, Anna, why didn't you appear? It read, quote, "'Twas a plan of deviant pleasure so bold on that spring night, my inner feeling hot with propension of the new awakening season, worn wet with inner fear and rapture, my pleasure of entanglement, like new vines so tight. Oh, Anna, why didn't you appear?" Unquote. Needless to say, Anna was so completely horrified, she up and moved as far away from Wichita as she could, and as fast as she could. And just days later, Dennis Rader graduated from Wichita State University with a bachelor's degree in administration of justice, of all the things. It was mid-June, 1979. Although Dennis was thoroughly enjoying all of the media attention he was getting, he was also becoming increasingly worried about getting caught. He did the best he could to, you know, hunker down. He got more heavily involved in his church. He even became a ranking official within his church. He became a Cub Scout leader once Brian, his son, was old enough to join. His kids and wife saw nothing but a completely devoted husband and father who worked hard and was active in the community. His daughter has written a book called, quote, A Serial Killer's Daughter, My Story of Faith, Love, and Overcoming, unquote, where she describes how no one even had a hint at just how evil her father actually was. She has said that, on occasion, he'd show his bad temper, but she was never scared of him. I mean, no one was. Looking at family photos, you see a man helping his kids decorate the Christmas tree. You see a man spending tons of time with his children. You see a man in full Boy Scout leader garb. He spent a lot of time with his family. I mean, no one suspected a thing. According to Dennis, he still never stopped trolling people as possible victims, but he didn't act on his urges for years. Then, at 40 years old, six years after his last murder, when his children were nine and six, he couldn't control it any longer. On April 27, 1985, Dennis and his son's Boy Scout group went on a trip not too far out of the city for a campout. In the evening, he told another adult that he had a headache and that he needed to make a quick trip into town to get medication. He excused himself, he drove back into Wichita, parked in a bowling alley parking lot, went inside and bought himself a beer. However, he didn't drink it. He merely swished it around in his mouth, spilled some on his shirt so that people would be able to smell the alcohol on him. He then called a cab. He acted like he was drunk and he had the cabbie drive him up near his home, telling the driver to drop him off just a bit away from the house so that he could, quote, walk it off before he got home. He walked to the home of 53-year-old widow Maureen Hedge, whose house was on the same street as his own. In fact, Maureen knew good and well who Dennis was. He walked to her house, saw her car in the garage, cut the phone line, and gained entry through her back door. But to his surprise, the house was empty, so he waited in a closet. Not too long after, Maureen and a male friend came into the house, but the man left at 1 a.m. Dennis then waited for Maureen to fall asleep. Once he was sure that she was asleep, he walked out of the closet, he quickly turned the light on, and he jumped on Maureen and strangled her to death. He then drug her body across the house and put her in the trunk of her own car. He then drove to his church, let himself in with the keys that were trusted to him, took her body to the basement. He put black plastic over the windows for added privacy. And then the fun began. Dennis took pictures of the woman's dead body while posing it in various ways. He then put her back in the trunk of her own car, 
drove out to the middle of nowhere, dumped her body, and drove back into town, dumping her car and wiping it for fingerprints. He then got back in his own car, drove back to the Boy Scout camp as if nothing had happened, and no one suspected a thing. Nearly a year and a half later, Dennis, who had been watching 28-year-old Vicki Wagerly for some time by walking past her house, decided she was the next hit. On September 16, 1986, Dennis knocked on her door dressed as a telephone repairman. He explained that he was in the area and needed to check her phone line, and she let him right in. He then held out a gun and told her to go into her bedroom. He then tied her up, but she fought hard against it, even leaving scratches on him. But he was able to tie her up. She told him that her husband would be home at any minute, but he strangled her to death with pantyhose and took pictures of Vicky in different positions. He then got into Vicky's car and he drove away. Vicky's husband noticed his own wife's car pass him on their street. I mean, that's how close it was. He knew his wife wasn't the one driving, but he couldn't make out who was driving. He arrived home to find his two-year-old son in the living room and his dead wife on the floor of the bedroom. She was pronounced dead at the hospital. Dennis drove around in Vicky's car for a bit, then parked it not far from her home, wiped it for fingerprints, and left. Unfortunately, Bill Wagerly was suspected of the crime, and though he was never officially charged, everyone suspected him of it until many, many years later. In 1988, Dennis was fired from ADT Security, the reason being that the company felt he was not meeting his work quotas. His co-workers said he was great with the customers, but not fun to work with generally. The next year, he worked for the U.S. Census Bureau, which afforded him time to travel throughout Kansas, and he later said he found other, quote, projects outside of the Wichita area, but he never really had time to act on them. So in early 1991, Dennis was now 45 years old, and he felt the itch to act out again. But now, he was well aware of the fact that he was, you know, getting to an age and he didn't want any part of a young woman or take the risk of a male being part of the picture. So he focused his energies on older women who he knew lived alone. He settled on 62-year-old Dolores Davis. She was somewhat new to the area and lived in a rental house without super close neighbors. She was perfect. He decided to act on a night that he would be on a camping trip with his Boy Scout group again. But it was the dead of winter and very, very cold. He made his excuses to leave the camp and he drove to his parents' house. They were away at the time. He changed clothes, then drove to a Baptist church, parked his car, and walked to Dolores' house. When he arrived, he peeked through the window and saw she was curled up in bed reading a book. So, he waited. Once she turned out the light, he walked to a sliding glass door on the other side of the house. He picked up a cement block and he threw it through the doors, shattering the glass. Dolores came running in to see what was going on. He immediately told her the same old story that he had told others, and then he tied her up. He then strangled her with a ligature. He then took her body outside, he put it in her trunk, and drove to a lake near a major highway, leaving her body under some trees. Dennis then drove the car back to her house, wiped it clean for prints, threw the keys on the roof of the house, and he walked back to his own car. He then drove back to where he had dumped her body and he put it into the trunk of his own car and drove around for a bit, but pulled under a bridge and dumped her there. He then changed back into his Boy Scouts gear and headed back to camp. The next night, he left camp again, he returned to the body and posed it in several different poses, took more Polaroids of it, and then he left. Within a couple of days, he dug a hole somewhere, 
He put himself in it with a mask on and he took photos of himself as if he were a dead body. And this is something that he would do, take Polaroids of himself looking like that he was bound and gagged in women's clothing with masks. And you can find these pictures if you Google them. So soon after, he was hired as a compliance officer in Park City. He was in charge of code enforcement and dog catching. Now he took this role very seriously. I mean, too seriously. He enjoyed writing tickets for people whose grass wasn't mowed short enough. Yes, he actually measured it with a ruler. He even harassed one woman horribly. She was recently divorced and after a while, a new man came to live with her. Dennis wrote ticket after ticket for odd, non-important things to her because he didn't like that she had let a man move in with her. One ticket was for the vehicle that the man was working on in the driveway. He told her that he would stop writing tickets if she forced that man to move out. He began peeping into her windows and even had her daughter's dog put to sleep. Needless to say, she quickly moved out of the area. The city began getting complaints about Dennis regularly, but they fell on deaf ears. On top of his authoritative role as a code enforcer, he also began serving on local city boards. In 1996, his father died, and soon after, his mother went into a nursing home. And then his kids were basically grown. His daughter Carrie graduated from Kansas State University, and it was obvious how proud he was of her. His son Brian joined the Navy and moved out of the area. Carrie got married and moved to Michigan. He had had a lot going on, but once his kids were grown and gone, and as he settled into the next stage of his life, he began to get bored. And as so many years had gone by since the last murder, people also stopped talking about the case. I mean, everyone just assumed the murderer had died or was caught, but it was just never connected. Then, all of a sudden, he was brought back into the spotlight by a lawyer who voiced his opinion that he felt BTK was being forgotten. He said he was going to write a book about the case. Then, a crime message board picked up on it and began talking about the case online. Then, in January 2004, everyone realized that it was the 30th anniversary of the Otero murders. The local media broadcasted and printed information about it and the BTK killer, and guess who noticed? Now, it didn't bother him that his crimes were garnering attention again. What actually bothered him was that he wasn't the one telling the story. It actually made him angry, and he immediately decided to make a comeback. He sent an envelope from, quote, Bill Thomas Kilman, unquote, to the Wichita Eagle. And inside were some photocopied pictures of Vicki Wiggerly that he posed. He also copied her driver's license that he had kept. The newspaper sent it to the FBI, and they confirmed that it was indeed the real BTK. The internet blew up. Everyone was about that return of BTK. All of the old fears came to the surface again. The public knew that BTK was still very much alive and also still very much around. Dennis sent a letter to KAKE TV received on May 5th, 2004, where it looked like he had tried to write in code and was sort of like the Zodiac. The letter could not be decoded. One month later, he left a package taped to a stop sign in the city's center. Inside was a letter that graphically described the Otero murders, drawings of 11-year-old Josephine hanging by a rope, and others. Then two weeks later, another package was found at the Wichita Public Library in the book return deposit. Inside was a message, and it read, quote, I have spotted a female that I think lives alone and or is a spotted latchkey kid. Just got to work out the details. I'm much older, not feeble now, but have to conditions myself carefully. Also my thinking process is not as sharp as it used to be. I think fall or winter would be just about right for the hit. 
Got to do it this year or next. Time is running out for me. Unquote. Another package was found in October 2004. Inside were pictures of children where Dennis had draw bindings, where Dennis had drawn bindings on them. He also wrote a sort of biography about himself, but the details were not even close to true, including his birthday. Unfortunately, the police released the false biographical information and Dennis found that immensely entertaining. He kept toying with the media, leaving bound up and gagged Barbies in packages and leaving cryptic letters. Then, on February 16, 2005, Dennis left another package with a floppy disk in it that was labeled, quote, test floppy for WPD review, unquote. He had previously asked if a disk would reveal where it came from, to which the police responded to him through the newspaper that they couldn't trace him that way. But, you know, of course they could, and they traced the disk back to Christ Lutheran Church and his name, Dennis. They checked the church's website, and lo and behold, they found that the current president of the church was Dennis Rader. They began to follow him. They got the okay to get a DNA sample from his daughter, though she was unaware, and it matched that DNA to evidence left at the scenes, his wonderful deposit at the crime scenes. On February 25th, 2005, while Dennis was driving home to have lunch, he realized that he was surrounded by a lot of police cars. He pulled over and surrendered with no issues. At first, he played dumb during the interrogation, but once they told him of the DNA match and the disc, he broke and began talking, and talking, and talking. He gave a total of a 30-hour confession. He was charged with 10 counts of murder and sentenced to 10 life sentences. He's living out his sentence in a prison in El Dorado, Kansas. Guys, if you haven't already seen them, I urge you to go to YouTube and look up his court videos. You can see when he's talking about his crimes that he just doesn't get it. He's so flippant about the whole thing. So what kind of serial killer is he? According to SVSD.net, the sociological theory of deviance that best explains Dennis Rader is social control theory. As a child, Raider joined the Boy Scouts and participated in his church's youth group to try and fit in. He was doing what he knew everyone expected of him to seem as normal as possible. However, he knew he was different when he began having fantasies about tying women up and torturing them, that this went against social expectations, so he hid his fantasies right away. But it is hard to completely suffocate our shadow selves. With Dennis, it presented itself by killing cats and dogs. As he got older and knew he couldn't do what the monster inside craved, he attempted to kind of reinvent himself by joining a fraternity. This only made him feel like more of an outcast and he began trolling for victims. There is no evidence of him killing anyone early on, but he did give in a little by starting to break into people's homes. Then, after the military, he again tried to make himself conform to social norms by getting married and settling down. He then was let go from work and again found himself in a low state of mind and slipped deeper into his fantasies. The attachment to social bonds was now mostly gone and the murders began. Just like Israel Keys, Dennis Rader had been ultimately successful in existing in two different worlds. One world, he was the epitome of responsibility, duty, and leadership. In the other, he was a controlling, self-centered psychopath with no empathy for others, the purest and more successful form. But what do you think? You can leave me a comment on Instagram at serial underscore killing or YouTube under the same name of this podcast. You can visit my website at serialkilling.squarespace.com 
And also, consider sponsoring the podcast. It takes a lot of time for me to put this information together, but I do love doing it. Thanks so much for listening. I appreciate every one of you, as I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me. Have a great day. Music by Kevin MacLeod on Incompetech.com.